Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Chevik, uh, founder and uh, director of the International Emergency Medicine Education Project. Welcome again another International Emergency Medicine Education Project live session. Uh, maybe many of you already watched the previous episodes. Uh, normally we start at on time, but uh, today we have some kind of technical difficulties and therefore we are trying to combine multiple background applications and programs to, to actually uh, to be live with you today. Uh, so uh, let, let me introduce our uh, program and projects to you. Uh, first, then I will uh, have our guest today. So uh, as you know, the International Emergency Medicine Education uh, Project is a, a global initiative to help medical students to understand emergency medicine and promote emergency medicine for medical students and also provide uh, emergency medicine related educational resources for uh, medical students freely. And this uh, platform or resources supported by the United Arab Emirates University College of Medicine and Health Science and also endorsed by the International Federation for Emergency Medicine, which is the global umbrella of emergency medicine around the world. Uh, I guess uh, currently we have almost 65, 70 countries under this umbrella and probably many of you actually watching at the moment this live uh, session. Uh, as I said, we are providing free resources. We have two main uh, the platform to provide these resources to you. One of them, iem-student.org. You can find uh, the chapters, topic chapters, and you can find MCQ questions. You can find some uh, copyright-free images and videos. Uh, including in this platform, also also in the YouTube, Flickr, uh, the channels. We have some audio chapters. You can find them in the SoundCloud, for example. And uh, of course, with the pandemic, uh, it was very difficult to uh, the, uh, the continue the emergency medicine training in many uh, medical colleges. So we open iamcourse.org platform. Currently, we are providing five courses in this platform freely for medical students around the world. And also, as you see now, uh, we are currently live in YouTube, uh, Twitter, and Facebook pages, hopefully in the, you know, uh, the LinkedIn, but I'm not sure I cannot see that screen at the moment. Uh, I have a couple news for you. And first of all, uh, the, some of you may remember we published our first emergency medicine clerkship book, free book for medical students in 2018. And I'm really pleased to inform you that we come to the uh, final stages to decide to which topics actually will be in the next edition. And the 5th of May, we are deciding our topics. And immediately after this, we are going to invite our contributors uh, to this uh, book uh, production uh, process. And hopefully at the end of the 2022, we will have second edition of Emergency Medicine Clerkship book for medical students. Uh, maybe you have a couple emails recently from us. Uh, we sent some uh, emails, including surveys, and asking about your opinions, which chapters should be in this collection book. So your participation is really, really important, and we really appreciate the, so far almost 130 participants to these surveys, and your opinions definitely will affect our decision for the chapters in this book. So we are looking forward to more participation, so please open your emails and fill the survey and we really appreciate your support about this. Another information I want to give today is an announcement. As you know, uh, the IFM uh, does its uh, annual conferences uh, in different uh, the countries and regions. And the next one, it will be between 14th and 19th June uh, in Melbourne, Australia. So one of the important thing actually uh, about the medical students is IFM Medical Students Symposium, which will be uh, happen first time in any IFM Congress history, uh, which is, as you see, this is the 21st uh, international conference on emergency medicine. But first time IFM organizing medical students symposium. Uh, this uh, activity led by Dr. Elif Dilek Chakal and uh, Dr. Erin Simon. Uh, so, uh, let me give you a couple of details about this. Actually, in this symposium, uh, there will be seven teams from different regions, and each team has 
uh, five uh, participants, uh, the two facilitator, faculty facilitator, and three student presenters uh, in these teams. And each team uh, will give their uh, insight about their context and information about the emergency medicine education in the medical schools. And then the, altogether, we will have seven breakout rooms with the audience, and we will discuss some of the positive, negative, and some areas to improve about emergency medicine training in the medical schools. And the last stage, uh, we will share all these discussions with the uh, audience again in the symposium. So to register this, you can visit ICEM2020.com uh, for the conference, or if you just want to join to this uh, special student event, uh, you can actually register separately uh, for this event. And there is a very minimal uh, nominal fee that IFM actually decided to put for this uh, activity, which is 10 uh, Australian dollar, uh, probably seven or six or seven uh, the US dollar. So therefore we are expecting uh, the many uh, attendees from all the regions, and we are looking forward to shape the future of emergency medicine training in medical schools. Uh, yeah, uh, after these announcements, of course, today is the emergency medicine perspective of students around the world. And this time, this is our uh, sixth session discussing the, uh, this perspective from different students. Today, uh, we will host uh, three guests from North America, and we will discuss the North American students' experiences about emergency medicine and their opinions about the, the, the specialty and the future plans and everything. Uh, and uh, of course, we are organizing this event, uh, and you always see Dr. James and I in front of the screen, but we have also Dr. Elif Dilek Chakal, uh, which is part of the IFAM Core Curriculum and Education Committee. Uh, behind the scenes, she is doing a lot of uh, uh, bureaucratic, you know, activities and you know checks, and therefore we are really, really appreciate her uh, help uh, on these processes too. Now, uh, before I uh, invite our guest today, uh, maybe you are already familiar with. Every time we start these sessions, uh, we uh, actually host uh, the next president of IFEM, which is Fionn Davis, uh, in our sessions. Unfortunately, today she is not here, but uh, she shared uh, a video, a short video with us. And after watching the Fionn's greetings, we will be our guests. Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Fionn Davis and I'm the President-Elect of the International Federation for Emergency Medicine, IFEM. IFEM is an organisation that represents over 70 countries around the world. IFEM supports and collaborates with the IEM project. IEM's great success is a tribute to Drs. Chervik, Chakar and Kwan and many others who have worked very hard to bring together content for the medical students around the world and this great idea of having a coffee chat so that you all get to know each other. All three of these doctors work very hard within IFEM and we really appreciate all of their input and we want to attract young people into the specialty of emergency medicine. So have a great chat today, it's all about connecting with each other. Spread the word, word about IEM to your fellow medical students and we hope that you join our specialty which is the most exciting specialty of all specialties in medicine. Bye, everybody. Uh, we, we, we thank Fionn, uh, her support, uh, always with us, and she's always ready to you know, help and improve the emergency medicine training around the world. And we, are, we can't wait, actually, to work with her uh, uh, almost in a month uh, as, a, as a president of IFEM. All right, now I just want to change my scene to our guest scene. Uh, and hopefully uh, we will be able to see us. Hello, everybody. Can you talk? Hello, Alpa. Yeah. <laughs> hello, hello, hey James. Hello. hello. Yes, Kyla is here, Holly is here, Brenda is here, and James here. Shall we start? Introducing ourselves. Sure. How do you want to do this, Alpha? Uh, yes. Let's start with you, James. 
All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Alpha. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to thank you first for getting this, uh, this whole session live again. As you probably heard earlier on, um, we had a few technical difficulties, which we, um, we managed to get over. So thank you, Alpha, for, for getting this session live again. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is James Kwan. And I am the current chair of the IFM Core Curriculum and Education Committee. I'm an emergency physician uh, with, uh, working in Singapore at the moment. I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone around the world joining for another coffee chat event. As you know, we've had five other such similar events, and they've been quite fun in getting to know our medical students across the world. I'd like to thank Alpa again for inviting me for coffee and the opportunity to have an informal chat over coffee with our student leaders from North America, Brenda and Kayla, and Hallie, who is actually currently a second year resident. Hallie, please correct me if I'm wrong. And a member of the leadership team of the Global Emergency Medicine Student Leadership Program. I'd like to say a few words about specialty. So as a specialty, emergency medicine provides many diverse and unique learning opportunities for our medical students. And I'm really looking forward to actually um, having a chat with our student leaders and with Hallie, who is actually on the other side now as a resident to see, to tap into the experiences of students and um, uh, experiences residents in emergency medicine and how the international community could better support them as, um, in, their, in their time as students and their time as residents. So with that, um, we'll move on to Kayla. Kayla, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey everyone, I'm Kayla. I am coming to you from South Carolina and um, I am an M4 and I graduate in five days. So I'll officially be a doctor in five days. Um, so I'd love to talk to you all about um, the end of medical school during a pandemic. Um, COVID started right as I started my third year. So I kind of experienced all of my clinical responsibilities during COVID. So I'd love to chat about that um, and how I haven't really been in the emergency room before COVID. So it's been interesting. Um, but yeah, I am just really excited to get to know um, all of you guys and talk to you today. Nice to have you, Kayla. I think Welcome. Uh, Brenda. Hi, my name is Brenda. I'm a third year medical student. Um, just like James was saying with the Wi-Fi, the only variable different from the other sessions was I am from Windsor, Ontario, so you can blame all of the technological challenges on me. <laughs> I am a third year medical student at Central Michigan University, so I'll be starting fourth year in a bit. I would like to talk to you a bit about my experiences in emergency medicine. I've done some work in Canada and some work in the US. I'm originally from Canada, um, but I'm studying medicine in the States, so I'd love to talk to you a bit about that because the summer internship I did in Canada hit as soon as COVID started, and a lot of my friends and colleagues in Canada um, experienced emergency medicine very differently than I did in the States. So I look forward to talking to you guys about that. All right. How about you, Hallie? Thank you. First, what an honor it is to be here. I'm super excited to partner more with IEM. As James mentioned, I am a first year resident, actually not a second year. I went to school at Marshall University, which is in Huntington, West Virginia, and now I'm a first year emergency medicine resident at Prisma Health. Um, and as you mentioned also, I am the upcoming resident co-director for the GEMS LP program, which is the Global Emergency Medicine Student Leadership Program. It's a project that is kind of in partnership with ASEP, and the goal of our program is to introduce medical students who are interested in having a career in global emergency medicine to their like-minded peers, connect them with mentors, establish them with projects, and really just get them exposure to the field. We actually have our final journal club session, which is happening tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern time, and I would like to invite all of you. At this journal club, we'll be having presentations from each of our mentees. We've got projects talking about Uganda, the state of emergency medicine for Brazil. We have some country report updates, and I'm just really excited to see what our mentees have been working on this year. 
Likewise, they also submit blog posts that we post through the IEM website, which has been an awesome collaboration. I thank you for that. So I invite you to check that out as well. I went through medical school definitely during the pandemic like the other two. I started during third year and we were sent home from rotations at that time. And then, of course, going through my first year of residency during the pandemic has been an interesting learning experience. And I'm excited to talk to you guys about that. Thank you for having me. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, before we go on, Alpa, I'm just wondering whether you could do a quick sound check that the people on the platform are actually hearing you. I'm, uh, I understand that then our sound may not be getting through. Uh, the, actually, the, the, in, in our actually the settings, uh, everything works fine and sounds are OK and uh, uh, looks going fine. Did yeah. you have, did, you, did you get any message from? Uh, I did our, get a message from um, yeah. our colleague Elif, who's in the background, yeah. Yeah. and uh, exactly she's good. actually saying she didn't hear a lot of what we were saying. So, okay, all right. So, uh, uh, anyhow, we are actually uh, uh, cool. It, it's it's everything looks like working very fine, yeah. but we are recording the sessions anyway. So yeah. if any sound issue happens in the, the sessions, we will upload this video uh, as a replacement of the bad one. So I think it will be fix everything, hopefully. Uh, but from my side, I think every, everything's working well. This, this, whole, this whole session just reminds me of Ron Zink's book on uh, anyone, anything, anytime. This is what emergency medicine is all about. And I think we are really embracing what emergency medicine is all about is actually, you know, dealing with, you know, situations that we actually don't have a lot of control over sometimes. So that's great. a great start <laughs> to the whole live <laughs> session. Yes. And, um, and I guess we all make, we'll make the best of it. So um, before we move on, just a few words on housekeeping. I realize that this event is being live streamed on a range of social media platforms. So Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and actually on the IEM website as well. Um, as for the audience, um, you will not be able to speak during the event. Please share your questions, comments, reflections on the social media platform you're using to view the event. We will be able to see your comments um, from all the social media platforms. We will also attempt to answer as many questions as we can, although due to time limitations, we probably will only get through a couple of questions. Needless to say, please share your, share your comments in a professional manner. Now, I guess we should just sit back, uh, or you can sit back, with your favorite beverage um, and enjoy the event. Thank you. <laughs> Alpha. Yeah. Yeah, James. Back to you. Okay, uh, James, uh, I think we can start with Kayla and Brenda uh, about asking, so what is this emergency medicine interest coming from? And while you're actually interested in the emergency medicine and enjoying the medical school in some experiences with emergency medicine, so what are your experience actually? What, what did you experience so far as a student? Brenda, you wanna start? Yeah. Um, sure, so I guess the start in emergency medicine I always affiliated emergency medicine with adrenaline. I love zip lining, um, zip lining through like extreme weather conditions. I used to be part of the triathlon team during my master's. And I did some part-time research in the emergency department while I was doing my master's. And I just really got along with the people there. So it felt like a good fit. The people were great. I had, I got a great mentor there, Dr. Friedman, who really helped me out, not only in emergency medicine, but research and academia. Um, so that's kind of how I got into emergency medicine. So my internship in Canada happened at the start of COVID. So that got transitioned to being online. So a lot of like focus and like just a lot of the lectures, instead of being in person, like using ultrasound, like it was online, which was very different than um, in the States where everything was in person. They got into person a lot quicker. So it was interesting. I would say definitely hands-on was a way better way of learning in the emergency department. Um, 
but I wouldn't say that virtual learning was completely empty to begin with. Like I still got a lot from those sessions. And I think it also helped me prepare for actually being in person on actual patients. Another thing that my school offers that's kind of unique is we have simulation labs. And kind of what they do is it'll be a mannequin and you're in a room with a video camera, someone sees their two way mirror. And it's interesting, you'd think, oh, it's a mannequin, it's not stressful, but they will simulate it so accurately that you're in a stressful situation. And then you could either work in a team or by yourself. And while they record you, you get feedback right after, like, how do you think you did? How was your communication? What would you do better? And it's just a very interesting learning experience, especially in emergency or high acuity settings um, to go through and to get that feedback live. So comparing all these three different modalities, I think there's no wrong or right answer. I think it's how you prefer to learn. I personally prefer to learn in the actual setting, but I also enjoy the feedback and the fact that I won't have stress of actually harming someone. And also the online learning straight to begin with, it kind of gives you a primer. So you know what you're doing in those actual settings. Um, so I found that was pretty neat and interesting. And a lot of my Canadian colleagues that did their rotations virtually, um, it was tricky. It was hard, especially during COVID. I can't say I've experienced it firsthand, but definitely um, I can't imagine actually doing an, an entire rotation online. Um, Kayla, I don't know if you did that online. Maybe you could share some of your experiences. Um, no, actually, I didn't really have to do many of my clinical rotations online. I finished up second year online, so we had some tests and things, but that wasn't really a big deal. Um, by the time my third year started, we were in the hospital and we were, we were pretty much just told not to see any COVID patients. Um, however, in the emergency department, I'm sure you guys know, uh, pretty much everyone was being treated like they had COVID um, at that time it was like COVID until proven otherwise. And so that was a little bit challenging um, to not be able to see really any respiratory patients, um, even just a pneumonia or anything, um, because the, for, the hind thought was that maybe they have COVID. Um, but eventually we uh, started seeing COVID patients. So I'm, I'm glad because when I enter um, the ED in just a few short weeks, there's still a lot of COVID. Um, so, but it really wasn't, it really wasn't too bad. Um, it's just interesting now because when I work up, like in my head, when I work up a respiratory illness, um, I have to remember that, you know, RSV and all of these, all of these things still exist. It's not, it's not just COVID, um, but it, it has been interesting. And Hallie knows a lot more because she's been there. <laughs> yes, share with us your experience, Hallie. My experience is a little bit different. So first of all, I went to a pretty small medical school where we actually don't have a core emergency medicine rotation. So it's a struggle to get into EM in the first place going to a school without a home program. And then on top of that, we had the, the pandemic and that really limited uh, what we call our array rotations, which I'm, I'm not sure if other countries have that really. But in the United States, we kind of do these audition rotations and we'll go and rotate through other emergency departments as a way to experience and kind of try out their program or see other places. Uh, in March is when we were sent home from my third year medical student rotations. And at that point, you know, the whole world was super scared. It was locked down. Nobody knew what was going on. And honestly, we were kind of, I don't want to say swept under the rug, but they just didn't know what to do with the medical students at that point. Um, we hadn't started our virtual platforms at that point. There wasn't a way to really integrate us into a clinical setting from a virtual um, method. So we were just kind of at home for weeks and weeks and weeks, not doing anything. Um, finally, we did get to go back a couple of weeks later. And at that point I was on my psychiatry rotation. And thankfully that was something that was easy to do over zoom whenever they were doing their interviews with, um, just kind of regular checkup patients. So that was nice, but I missed the majority of my internal medicine rotation, which I think was difficult and a really valuable one that People usually learn a lot from, so that was a little disappointing. And then it came time to do my away rotations, which were a very stressful event even before the pandemic because you have to apply and you don't have a home program. You don't have a lot of um, leadership or mentorship 
whenever you don't have your home residency program. And unfortunately, we were kind of limited to a geographical restriction on where we could go from my school just for travel purposes and COVID. Thankfully, I was able to do an away rotation at the University of Kentucky and also WVU, both of which I really enjoyed and I was really thankful for. And similar to the other students, we weren't allowed to see COVID patients. Um, it was very kind of... I guess difficult is a good way to explain it, not being able to see everybody. Um, starting residency though, all bets were off and we were kind of shoved right into the mix of everything. And that was a little bit scary, not knowing really how to treat these patients or having seen them before clinically, but it was easily learned and our hospital did a really good job of incorporating us into that. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, where, where I worked, you know, we, we were told you have to trust your PPE. So this 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 idea of oh um you know the not seeing COVID patients is actually interesting, isn't it? When we're all dressed up in PPE and yet, you know, um, we still feel uncomfortable that um, we could still get COVID at the time, you know, even in full PPE dress. So uh, that's that's really interesting. It, it's it it was interesting times actually. All three of you were slap bang in the middle of the that whole pandemic. You know, you were effectively rushing to see what was happening. So I'm, I'm actually interested, um, what was a positive learning experience for you during this period? What, what did you learn in terms of being uh, during your emergency medicine rotation? You can start off with anyone. Um, and I guess, Kayla, you, you, you um, are just about to graduate. So maybe let's, let's start with yeah. you. Um, so I will say, even though it's been quite the challenge, um, I really saw people step up in the, in the community of the ED um, and like look out for each other. I personally was pregnant for a lot of my rotations and people were, um, very kind and like, you don't, don't go see COVID patients or, um, just, I felt like people respected each other, um, more than usual. And then also from the outside community, a lot of patients were very thankful, which can be rare. I think in the emergency department, not everyone is very grateful, but, um, in my experience, I had a lot of patients that were over the top grateful um, that we were working through this pandemic and, um, you know, gowning up in full PPE for every room and just a lot of things that we weren't used to. Um, so I'll say I, I felt like the camaraderie was a beautiful thing that came out of this not so beautiful pandemic um, in my personal experience. You know, Kayla, that's, that's wonderful. Because that's the first time I've heard in all our sessions, you know, being brought up about looking after each other mm -hmm. and, you know, looking after yourself and looking after each other, which is really an important aspect of actually becoming an emergency physician or, you know, um, becoming uh, into um, coming to life as a professional. So I think that's that's really important, you know, important thing that you uh, brought up as a learning point. Um, Brenda, did you feel looked well looked after or how um, did you feel you weren't being looked after? I really like that you brought that up because I think one of the reasons why I love emergency medicine, internal medicine, just a lot of the inpatient specialties is the teamwork. It makes such a big difference to work in a team where everyone has each other's back. Like as my dad always used to tell me, like we're all interconnected, synergy is really important, working in a team. And I think it's really important that you brought that up. I definitely noticed that in the ED, like they were very accommodating to learners. Like if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to go in, but if you are like, you're welcome to learn. So just being very accommodating. I think one thing I definitely, I don't know if I learned, but observed during the pandemic was just public health and epidemiology was very, very interesting at that time. I really want a career in, um, doing research in addition to medicine and clinical practice. So just seeing how research was conducted, how quickly it could change, um, how some of the journals altered, how they published during that time. It was just so interesting to watch and observe. So I think 
not even learning, but from an observer perspective, it was really neat to see academia during the COVID pandemic. And one of the questions I had is if another pandemic like this came up, how can we keep up um, safety pr protocol, but also be mindful of the environment? I, a lot of the PPE going to waste, um, I, I understand the need for protection, but I'm also wondering how can we do that without impacting the environment? Now that's a question I don't know if I have the answer, if I'm even qualified to come up with the answer, but just watching science during that time has been fascinating. Great. And then it's I have a actually, question actually yeah. to the, uh, the Kayla and Brenda. Uh, as a student, how did you find, uh, uh, let's say, inclusivity as a student in the emergency department? Because it's already in a very fast paced, uh, busy, and always uh, the doctors and residents always actually the busy with something, uh, particularly for the patient care. But uh, as a medical student, uh, did you feel you're part of the team always, or uh, is there anything you know the teams should do to involve more patient uh, care uh, by the you know medical students or their activities in the department as best as they can? Any area to improve? So personally, um, I'm sticking around for residency where I did school. Um, and a big reason is because the inclusive, they're so inclusive of students. Um, and I think that comes from the top down. Um, we have a really great program director and clerkship director that are very um, adamant that residents include medical students. And we have so many residents. We have 13 each year about. Um, and so our class this year coming in is going to be 13. So um, I think that has a lot to do with it. The residents aren't spread, I guess, super, super thin. Um, and they have the time to, to spend with medical students. Um, and I think something important that I want to take in with me to residency is that um, in some specialties, they would say, okay, we're going to spend an hour or two hours at the end of the day talking about this specific topic. And then the end of the day would come. And a lot of times that wouldn't happen. Everyone just was ready to go home. But specifically in the emergency department, we just kind of teach on the go and just little nuggets of information as we go. And I think that is more valuable than a whole hour, hour and a half at the end of the day when everyone's tired and your brain can't absorb anything else. Um, so I think that's a good takeaway that I would like to do as a resident um, for incoming medical students is just these little, little tidbits of knowledge as you go throughout the day, I think stick more, especially when you have a patient's face um, to go with the lab value or, or whatnot. Um, I think it, it sticks a lot better. Right. Was it the same for you, Brenda? Um, I, yes, I do agree. Like there was a lot of learning on the spot. Um, I really, so my experience was a bit unique. So I'm in a very small rural hospital. So in third and fourth year, we can pick our main hospital and we're either in Lakeland, Detroit, um, Midland or Saginaw. And I picked Midland specifically because there's no residents. It's one on one of the attending. And I found that the best way to get the experience during these rotations is at the beginning of each shift, whoever I was placed with, I would tell them, challenge me, treat me like a resident. I want to be pushed. I'm interested in this field and I want to learn as much as possible. And I found that most um, attendings, when you kind of gave them that introduction, like I want to learn, I'm here to learn. They were really good in letting me see like a few patients. So like I had a really good attending where say three or four patients came in, he'll say, okay, you take these two, I'll take these two, do a history, full physical, and then come see me. So I'd present my patient and he'd be like, what do you want to do next? And he'd verify and confirm, but I'd also be responsible to double checking, like when did the labs come in? When did the imaging come in? And I'd interpret it and then I'd go to him and be like, okay, this image came in, it hasn't been read by the radiologist yet, this is what I think. And oftentimes, cause I suck at imaging and radiology, they'd have, they'd all give me a lecture and it still doesn't, Thick. I still look at an x-ray and I'm like, well, I see bones and a lung. There's a lung in there. But um, I find that often, uh, <laughs> this is why I'm in emergency medicine, not radiology. Um, a lot of times, um, if you just tell them, 
that you're eager to learn, they will give you that opportunity. Because I had a very different experience from a lot of my colleagues that they kind of just went in and like you said, emergency doctors are busy. And if they see someone who doesn't want to learn, they're not going to put that time. But I think a really good way too is also to ask them, how do you learn? How do you want to learn? Do you learn by observing? Do you learn by seeing patients? Because I definitely know some of my colleagues are very much observers and auditory learners, and I can't do that. I need to be very hands-on to learn. Um, but I definitely think taking one or two patients and following them the entire visit is so rewarding because you kind of monitor their progress over time. And it really helps you with that emergency department mindset. Like one, what are the main things that can kill them that you can have to watch out for? Then two, do they need to be admitted to the hospital or not? Because well, it does seem intuitive. A lot of what we see in a textbook doesn't match in real life. Like we'll see a patient and I'll be freaking out over labs. And then the doctor will be like, ah, oh, it's fine. Like, what are you panicking about? And I'll be like, but there's sodiums like off the record. And they're like, what's their baseline or something like that. So I definitely think I had a really good experience. And the main thing is giving students opportunities to take a patient and follow them. Now, mind you, the physician would make the final decision. Um, but also even asking, how do you learn? Sometimes students are a little shy. I know I was definitely very shy starting out. Um, I definitely had to learn to be more assertive during rotations or else the doctors would be busy and I'd kind of get pushed off to the side. But yeah, definitely um, real life simulation, asking students, how do you learn? How do you best learn? How can I help your learning experience? And then sometimes if it gets busy, you have to modify that. But oftentimes um, they were really good at incorporating our learning styles into the situation. This is great. Actually, I just want to hear from the Hadi's experience as, as a resident, because I think you very uh, highlighted a very important point, uh, which is uh, you had a chance to work with attending, you know, one by one. Uh, if there is any other level of trainees between you and the attending, so therefore your exposure should be less, uh, such as interns or first year residents or second year residents or, or any other rotators from other departments. Uh, so how do, you, how, how do you think, what, what do you think uh, uh, about the Brenda's actually comments on working with one-to-one -one with attending physicians? Do you think the residents affecting medical students learning, you know, uh, badly or uh, do you think uh, it is actually they're working together so they learn together? So what, what is your insight? It was really interesting to hear from both of them. And I remember when I was a medical student kind of feeling the same way that I got to show up and I got to be super excited and eager and make sure that they realize that I'm there to learn and be proactive in my own learning. So um, it's nice whenever I hear or see students that come into our department who have the same mindset and you can, you can pick them out. So if you're somebody who is a medical student, and you're interested in going into this field, take these comments from both Kayla and Brenda and use them because it's extremely important and will definitely influence your learning. Both of my away rotations were in facilities that had residents and then our home ER, even though we don't have a program, we do have attendings and an emergency department, just not necessarily a program. So I kind of got to experience both where I was working directly with attendings at my home institution and then with residents during my away rotation. They were both really valuable. And I'll say that even during the ones where I was working with a resident, we did get the opportunity to work with attendings because most emergency departments, or at least the ones that I've had experience with, your attending is very close by um, and giving you a proper level of oversight. And even at my program, you know, they're always there. They're always accessible if we have questions, but we have enough kind of hands off also where we get the autonomy. The medical students that rotate at my program will usually check out to a resident. I did have a couple of medical students throughout the year. I wasn't super responsible for them during my first couple of months of residency because it's just hectic and busy, but those were the students who were primarily interested in going into emergency medicine. So I'm sure that they were a little different. By the time that I was having students, they were the ones who were just doing their core rotations that were required. So I think that they were a little bit different um, in their learning style, I guess. But it was helpful to me. I really enjoy having medical students because they take great histories. And you're right, we're super busy. And it's always nice to kind of have, I don't want to call it an extra checkbox, but almost like an extra safety net of a person seeing a patient because they'll maybe hear things that I didn't hear. And then the story always changes by the time that my attending sees them. So I really enjoy having medical students. And I think that the comments that both of them made about just being eager and showing up and being willing to learn are really important. 
And if you are given the opportunity to work directly with an attending, I think that's also very valuable because they offer different insight. I think from residents specifically, you'll learn a lot about time management and efficiency, and we'll try to throw in some information when we can, but I didn't get a good idea of the flow and the workload of working in an ER until I worked with residents. Yeah, in my, in my institution, actually, we, we are actually running the ninth year of Mercy Medicine Collection. It's a very new, actually, if you compare to other countries. Uh, the every uh, time at the end of the year, or at the end of the collection, actually, we, we do some uh, the surveys on the students, and they always mention that, you know, where they learn more. Uh, always residents come on the top. I mean, they, they want to work with residents uh, rather than the attending physicians. Uh, uh, they think residents actually, they are more willing to share their knowledge and experience with the, uh, the medical students than the attending physicians. Uh, I'm not I sure. wonder whether that's actually true, you know? I don't know. I, I don't know because you, you see, Brenda's having a different experience here. Brenda's having a completely different experience. I wonder whether it's actually about the person themselves rather than th whether they're attending or resident. You know, um, yeah. Yeah. I guess um, being, uh, you know, having that one-to-one -one relationship and even um, a more, you know, longitudinal relationship. So being there for a while, um, and being treated as part of the team, that sort of um, community of, uh, I, I call it a community of learning. It's a, it, it's a term that's not out there in the medical literature or the uh, um, edu medical education literature, but I call it a com community of learning. That whole being integrated into that uh, clinical environment and being able to learn and participate in that learning. Um, it, 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 whether attending or resident, I, I don't know. I, I tend to think that is probably the person themselves. But what I'm actually going to be more interested, uh, I'm actually quite interested in whether you can give um, other residents uh, tips or even attendings tips on when the going gets tough, when you see the environment really changing and it's starting to get busy what kind of advice would you give, you know, attendings or residents who are facing that and trying to strike a balance looking after you as students and also looking after patients at the same time? Any advice you can offer them? Uh, maybe, um, Kayla, um, any advice you could offer? And then we'll go to Brenda. Yeah, I think even, I think it can be daunting to say, okay, I have a medical student that I'm responsible for. I have to teach them all these things. When in reality, just them watching, like literally just following you into the room and observing how the questions you ask or how you do a procedure is incredibly helpful. Even if you're not, even if you don't have the time to necessarily explain everything in depth or, um, truly like include the medical student in your decision making when when the when it's crazy when it's chaotic um i just think being being aware that the student is there and um like allowing them to come into the room with you because a lot of times if a student isn't eager to learn they they can end up sitting you know behind the computer for a good bit of the shift um which is another reason I think, you know, when you have a student that isn't interested in emergency medicine, because they're not, they're like following you, even if you're going to the bathroom, <laughs> um, <laughs> they're just on your tails following you, make sure they don't miss anything, but as an attending or resident or whomever, um, I think just including the student, um, just into the room with the patient. Yeah, I think I think I think that's a, that that's a great tip. Just involving that student. So, um, any 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 tips for for us as preceptors, Brenda? Um, I agree with Kayla. Like, if it gets super super hectic, I think communication is important. Don't just disappear on the medical student. They have no idea why you're gone. It's like, oh, did I do something wrong? <laughs> like, what did I do? But like, at least tell them, hey, it's busy. Do you want to follow me? But I guess also engage the student, like when it comes to decision things, like as soon as you come out, just quickly ask a question, what's on the top of your differential? What would you want to do next? Um, 
because then it becomes passive. And like I said, I'm very hands-on and I don't mean in a terrible way, but if I'm just observing for a long period of time, I kind of zone out and I don't mean to, I just, I need to be engaged and thinking. Um, so I think at least engaging in, or asking questions as you go along, even if the student's following. And Kayla and Haley, I don't know if you noticed this, but um, there's a lot of, I guess, like PAs, um, nurse practitioners, so sometimes, like, especially if it's very sensitive cases, like psych patients where you can't even follow them, um, you can learn a lot from those other specialties too, because a lot of times, like when you're leading a team, you got to know what is the extent of their knowledge? What can they do? What are they allowed to do? How can you incorporate them when you're leading a big group? So I think even um, following them sometimes is good. I had a really good experience with a uh, PA when we were seeing a COPD patient who also had lung cancer and just going in doing the physical seeing how they do the physical the questions they ask um, I'm a huge proponent that you can learn from everyone so I guess like one either engaging medical students in the process if they follow you and if there's no opportunity for them to follow you then who else can they follow and learn from because oftentimes so many people have so much to teach. Yeah, I, I think that what you're mentioning it's uh, the, the being in in the critical you know, uh, decision making or clinical decision making processes in everywhere, not just the emergency medicine. I think it definitely, you know, uh, activate the students, you know, the thinking differently rather than, you know, reading the books, understanding the whole concepts, but it doesn't actually really uh, happening uh, in front of you when you face with the patient. So uh, in that uh, time limited information deficient environment let's say as an emergency department uh, how the emergency physicians think how the emergency medicine residents think i think uh, the students should be involved more about this decision making processes to understand uh, how they can act in the you know uh, in the future if they exposed to some kind of emergency quick decision making you know uh, issues uh, the, the, i just want to uh, the ask one thing, it's actually very important to be in the healthy learning environment. Uh, I'm not sure the emergency medicine or emergency departments can be considered healthy learning environment uh, because of its nature. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, the attendings attitude, residents attitude and students actually uh, the eager, uh, the being eager to learn, that affect everything in that environment. If I ask you one question, as a learning environment, if you evaluate the emergency medicine as a learning environment, what did you like most and what you didn't like? Uh, and what, what, what do you recommend to change uh, as a learning environment in the emergency department? Or uh, did, you didn't understand my question because of my terrible English grammar? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or maybe no, and I, I just think that they were thinking about the question, actually. So, you know, it's actually really interesting that um, sometimes it's not, it's not for want of not wanting to do, it's for want of actually being um, given the opportunity to do it. Um, and I think that's where the learning environment comes in. Does that learning environment really support you to develop as a student or develop into your skills into a junior doctor, you know? And I, I and there are, there are things in the barriers in that learning environment, you know, of the emergency department. So are there things, can you think of anything that um, really impeded your, your learning experience in the emergency department? Were there things there that we could change as emergency physicians to help you learn better? I think looking back to the times that I was a medical student and now being a resident, one of the biggest things for me personally, and not just in a medical environment, but in any learning environment or any social environment is feeling welcome in general by the team that you're with. I'm the type of person, if I see anybody, I always try to say, hey, what's your name? What are you here for? What's, what are your goals sort of thing? And I think that going through training, we there's a lot of 
perceived notions from medical students about the hierarchy of medicine. And we get super nervous or anxious anytime that we have to interact with an attending or even a resident. And when I was a first year medical student, even talking to a third or fourth year medical student, it was always so nerve wracking. So I think that just initially really trying to set a calm and welcoming and understanding tone and then everything after that kind of falls into place, just really make an inclusive environment. So it's like a scariness factor, is it? There's a huge scariness factor. <laughs> it's a scariness factor. So it's we huge. have a new scale walking in. And so what's the scary, uh, um, scary scariness factor in, in the emergency department, in your emergency department? So, yes, we probably should think about doing that and actually reducing that, uh, you know, that scary factor. Um, what about yourself, uh, Kayla? So it's kind of funny that you said that, Hallie, because that was the first thing that I thought of too, is that I can remember certain residents that asked me my name and that remembered my name, but a lot of, um, a lot of residents would just say, oh, the med student's going to go see that patient or, hey, med student, come look at this lab value. And that seems so small, but really when someone took the time to learn my name and to call me by my name for the, for the shift, it made a huge difference. And I think like you were saying, Hallie, um, it's just about being inclusive and feeling welcome, feeling like you're part of the team, like you're not a burden on the resident or attending because when you're, when you feel like you're a burden, then you don't want to speak up as often or ask questions. And that really, I think can hinder the whole learning environment, um, just even internally in your brain, you, you aren't as excited or aren't as um, willing to step out on the ledge and ask a question. Um, so I think just something small like that, like learning their name. And if you're if you write it down on your hand for the shift or whatever, um, just so you don't forget and you're not referring to them as the med student, I think that can make a big difference. Yeah, that, 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 that term, isn't it? The med student, you know, no name, no nothing. Just this is the med student. It's med stud. Really, really like tough. Saying, you're coding, you know, like, like class, saying patient A or patient B, label something you. like this, yeah. You know, you don't have a badge or you don't have a label on you. You know, you just in your PPE. What's, what's that student's name again? And it just becomes oh, the fourth year medical student. So, yes, I'm guilty of that, actually. Um a lot of the time because I think um, I guess my memory is pretty bad. <laughs> my memory is pretty bad and it's really tough to actually remember everyone's name. So I, I think, you know, there are probably some things that we can do uh, role model uh, better in, and you're teaching us to role model better um, as senior clinicians as well is to get to know uh, our students' names and maybe little things to improve how we recognize our students and, you know, just even a label, just saying, you know, what your name is, your first name is, you know, I can just look straight at you and just say, ah, oh, this is Kayla or this is uh, Brenda. Excellent. You know, I don't have to keep remembering, mm, who's this behind the goggles and you're just trying to recognize their eyes. <laughs> um, you know, with their mask on. So yeah, it's 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 been challenging over the last couple of years with that. So yeah. thank you for really bringing that up. But what I'm actually going to bring up, uh, another thing I'm going to bring up is, I am aware that in the US, to get into a residency program, you would you have had to rotate through them, and so I understand that there were the away rotations, a lot of them were canceled um, because of COVID. So how did you get around that? You know, I mean, you, you, you're coming up to apply for residency or have applied residency, Kayla, but Brenda, you're coming up to doing it. And um, maybe we'll start off with Brenda, who's actually going, coming up to doing this. What, what, what's your take on this? Um, so I'm a bit it's weird. Like I haven't even picked my fourth year electives yet. Cause our school very much does a lottery system where you might not even get your first choice. And I don't think that's the best way to go about it, but I don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. So I can't really comment on it. Um, I think it's tough right now because a lot of schools are just starting to open away. So even though they're opening it, it doesn't mean that it's guaranteed. The spots aren't necessarily guaranteed. And even if you read the news, if there's fear of another outbreak in the fall, they might all get canceled. So there's definitely 
a lot of uncertainty, I think. And one thing that I plan on doing is contacting the programs directly to see. So if this happens, if X happens, how should I proceed? What are my options? Um, how are you guys planning for um, a potential outbreak or like the limited spots? Because a lot of people do want emergency medicine and there aren't a lot of spots or away rotations available. And I'm not so sure if it was the same way um, when you guys were applying, but you need at least two reference letters um, from some sort of an attending or clerkship director or chair. And it's very difficult to get. Um, so, I mean, even if you guys have any suggestions for myself and my class that I could pass on, I think your perspective, especially in a more resource limited time, could be very insightful. That, that's why I started with you, Brenda, because I think you are right in the midst of it. And um, Kayla, obviously, successfully, you know, you're, you're coming up to graduating in a few days. Is it tomorrow or the tomorrow, following day? Yes. No, tomorrow, is that right? <laughs> Graduation day. So it's Friday, actually. <laughs> it's Friday. So, Kayla, how did you navigate the um, that whole residency application process when many of the schools or many of the programs literally say, "Well, you know, you haven't rotated with us. You're not coming. You know, we're not even going to think about it. You know, we're not even going to. What is it? Rank you in the if you." Yeah, so um, we used the VSAS system, which is, I think, what Brenda was talking about, maybe, um, where you apply to all these away rotations. And what I experienced was normally in the years before, you could do two, three, four away rotations and get those letters and it would be done. Um, my year, we were limited to only one and we had to sign basically a contract uh that said you would only do one and schools had to do the same thing that they would um like only allow their students to do one unless your home institution didn't offer anything then you could do two but um i had the privilege of doing an away rotation and getting a letter through that um but it was it was difficult uh, i actually if i have this is a big piece of advice that i wish i had heard sooner um to do your away rotation in a, a setting that is different than your home institution. So for me, my home institution is very um, resident run. The, the department is uh, extremely resident run. And then I did my away rotation somewhere where it was more attending run and the residents had a little bit less autonomy. And I highly recommend that because I didn't really um, know there was such a big difference in programs. Um, and these programs, honestly, they're in the same state. So I didn't think they would be that different, but they were completely different. So if someone, um, if I could give a piece of advice, that would be one is to try to rotate at places that do, do emergency medicine completely different, maybe a community setting versus an academic setting. Um, but I, I will say, I think this year, um, I've been told at least that there's a, a huge emphasis, emphasis on your geography when you're applying to residencies. Um, a lot of programs, from my understanding, you know, offer all these spots to places, but then those people just end up going, just end up staying home or end up staying close to home. So now I, I've heard that the programs are going to be like, well, why do you want to come here? Um, I've spent so much effort in getting all of these people, but then they just end up staying at home. Um, and I think that's a weird thing that's been caused by the pandemic. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to want to go to a residency that I've never been to. I've never seen, I didn't even get to interview there in person because everything was virtual. So um, I think that's an interesting thing that's happening right now. And maybe it'll go back to normal after the pandemic, maybe not. But I do think having geographic ties is going to be very important um, in residency applications going forward. And if you don't have a, a tie, but you really want to go there, like being very forward about that and emailing, calling, whatever, and saying, I really am interested in your program, even though it looks like I have nothing to do with you, um, that kind of thing. I hope that answers the question. No, I, I think that's really good. I mean, we're, we're just sort of feeling our way through this, aren't we? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm sort of, a, I guess, aware um, that it is tough to get into residency. It's one of the top uh, residencies in the U.S. emergency medicine. So um, I am aware of how tough it is and I'm aware of how, um, you know, certain programs won't even give you a second look. 
um, if you've never done an away rotation. I mean, um, Hallie, what, what, was that your experience as well um, when you're applying for, for, um, for residency? It was tough because COVID started March and our away rotations were supposed to start in June or July. And I had several of them scheduled and many got canceled. There was a lot of frustration in one talking with my school to see if we were going to be allowed to do rotations, but that wasn't really my school's decision. It was a core decision, which is like the overlying emergency medicine kind of student body thing. There was a lot of discussion on their end. And so just a lot of confusion during that time. I think one big takeaway that I'm hoping that CORD and all of the programs going forward realize is that the away rotations are a really great benefit to us, but they're also a huge cost burden, time burden. We have to go there, find lodging for a month, which can be, you know, a thousand dollars. And we have to just all these things and getting there and arranging it in our schedule. Um, And I think that they're starting to realize that maybe students can have interests without necessarily having been there. And kind of like Kayla was saying, really emphasizing that communication. If you do have an interest in that program, really reach out to them ahead of time. You know, it's not always feasible to be able to do away rotation somewhere. I was nervous going into my fourth year before COVID that if we denied an away rotation that we were accepted to or couldn't go because of logistical reasons that that program would say, oh, they must not be interested, you know, let's not give them an interview. And it was kind of taboo to decline a rotation. And I think hopefully programs are realizing that there's just a lot of restraints on the students in arranging these and they're being more open to us having these difficulties getting away in these standardized letters. But that just kind of circles back to being really forward with your forward with your communication to these programs, um, and also being considerate of your fellow students. There was a lot of fear around my cycle and probably last cycle, and maybe more so going forward. And people were, you know, doing thirty plus interviews. So just remember your colleagues, and if you genuinely do not see yourself going to one of these programs, cancel that interview, um, save that spot for somebody else who really is interested in that program. Yeah, it's it's really interesting actually because um, that you say that you say this that maybe we should look into how we select our residents in Singapore uh, for emergency medicine. Um, our medical students don't transition straight into a residency program. They actually have to complete PGY a, a more general PGY one rotation first, and even at that point, they would spend another year in a, what we call a medical officer role, where they would also rotate through a bunch of other specialties, including emergency medicine, spending time. And one of the uh, one of the greatest challenges is that when we come to select. Um, faculty are often mentioned, I, I've not worked with this person before. So I'm, I'm not really sure I want to, you know, despite their, their being, you know, really, you know, they may have performed well in an interview and they may have done well in their other academic schools. They may have topped their medical school. It's, um, it's a real challenge getting over that hurdle of, I've never worked with this person before. So I'm not sure whether I would want, you know, to take that risk. And yeah. as I suppose it's getting overcoming that risk. Well, what do you think, Alpha? You know, you select residents. I, I think, I think it's, a, it's a very complicated thing. Uh, particularly, as we know, the every country has a different systems, of course. But my experience, the, the being in many countries and, you know, discussing with many friends, visiting many institutions and programs, I, I think uh, particularly for the uh, North America, I, I can say that uh, the majority of the programs actually having the uh, residents uh, who they already know. Let's say you're taking the 15 residents a year, but probably 10 of them, 10, 10 of them actually you, 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 you know them already. As attending as a, as a program director, as a you know associate program directors, and five of them probably. I, I'm just saying the numbers roughly, but I believe that it is it is the kind of you know for realistic, uh, the percentages. But uh, the other five probably the who are really really step up and you know shine in the you know, interview and also their CVs and showing many activities related to emergency medicine, extracurricular or intracurricular, whatever it is. So I I think it's very important to be, uh, as a person, 
one by one working with that department, attending physicians and department decision makers particularly. I think it's it's changed the whole path, I believe. Uh, but of course, it's not the case for every country. Uh, in some countries, you have to get into the national residency exam, for example, and, and you just choose the department that you want to go according to your score in that national exam, residency exam. So uh, if you perform very well in that exam, you can choose the first choice, whatever you want to go, and you will be there. But there will be no interview. So you don't know them. They don't know you. And, uh, and it's a kind of luck uh, how you fit in that system or how they fit your personality. I mean, it's, it's a kind of difficult uh, in many ways, uh, but uh, being you know, interviewed, uh, it's good. And working with that team, it's really, you know, very, very good thing. Uh, provide many, many advantages for the students who is applying to that program, I believe. I, I think I, I was just very privileged, I guess, um, trained in Aust being trained in Australia. We could move from hospital to hospital. We were not actually bounded by one institution. And maybe there would be a rotation out, you know, somewhere else. You know, I, I realized that the US residency models and, you know, and the Singapore residency model is so you out rotate to maybe another hospital or otherwise we don't necessarily need to out rotate uh, that much um, to other hospitals. Uh, you know, we could, we, we could do that. We could out rotate or we could actually just stay in that one hospital. So, I, I, I could move up around and I don't think um, uh, the residency programs have that sort of flexibility, which we enjoy, uh, which I enjoyed in Australia, which was great, which is great. There are pros and cons. And I don't think we can actually make a judgment call on, you know, which is better or which is not, you know, which is the, uh, you know, which system we should take up. I think it's contextually, you know, uh, driven uh, as the case may be. I, um, I think you brought up a good point, though, about um, that standardized exam. And I'm sure you guys know maybe um, that step one has become pass fail as of this year in for us um, here in America. And so I think it's a good thing. Personally, I think that it's a good thing that um, the applications are being viewed more holistically and less, you know, just based on an exam score. Um, and then also we have the standardized letter of evaluation, the SLOWS, which I think comes in handy when the attendings haven't necessarily worked with the patient or with the um, student, because other attendings in a standardized manner are saying how they think this student is going to um, is going to perform as a resident, which I think can be helpful when you haven't personally worked with them. Um, but I I'm glad that our our application process is becoming a little bit more holistic and less based on numbers. I can't imagine it just being based on one exam and you picking your specialty. That sounds, I mean, as personally as like not a great test taker, that sounds horrible. <laughs> um, and I think emergency medicine, sometimes the best test takers wouldn't make the best emergency physicians, you know, so, and really probably in any specialty. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Uh, you're just bottom. Definitely. By the way, just in case you want to know uh, something interesting, the USMLE was not designed to be a ranking exam. It wasn't de designed to rank students. And that's why they came probably came to realization that actually it's probably better used for another purpose and look at other things. The narrative of you know, being able to work with others, yeah. um, work as a team, you know, how you communicate, how you carry yourself professionally when you turn up for your shift in the morning. So, yeah, yeah I mean, there's, there's actually no right answer. Um, Alpha, I was just going to ask, actually, um, I, I find this really interesting because we, we've now got um, three, I won't say three students because one's a resident, but we've got a continuum, a, a spectrum yeah. Yeah. now. So I think it'll be worth asking how we as an international community can better support students at di different levels in their time, you know, in medical school, as well as residents. I'd be interested in hearing anyone uh, can start off, maybe Brenda. 
I was hoping I wouldn't have to start on this one. Uh, you don't have to start off. You don't have to start off. This is not a. This is yeah, not a this is gonna take someone a bit of thinking. <laughs> so let's see if someone else has an answer. Yes. Okay, so I, I can say a couple of things uh, while you know Brenda is thinking. Uh, I, I think this is very important. Uh, of course, we know that, uh, that North America is very advanced in the emergency medicine training and its programs, uh, including in the medical schools. Also, I, I'm talking about the emergency medicine training. And uh, of course, not every country is lucky as the American students or North American students. Uh, so therefore, uh, the, knowing your experiences and recommendations and, and applying those recommendations to international level by uh, international community like, you know, IFM, uh, I think it's, it's very important. Uh, so therefore, uh, IFM actually continues looking to engage with students recently, last three, four years, I believe. And we are definitely looking for a kind of uh, students representation in IFM. Uh, we have a, uh, I think, committee, I believe, right, James, uh, the training. Yeah, we actually have a residence uh... They call it the trainees committee because Train, um, trainees committee, outside yeah. of yeah. Uh, that North American system, they yeah. most of them known as specialist trainees. So there, there is a trainee committee, which I would encourage you when yeah. you become residents to or um, Halley to actually join. Um, there is a special, if I'm not wrong, there's a special interest group, a trainee special interest group in IFEM. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore, every every experience is very important. If it can if it can be actually transferred to that committee, so it helped the IFM to spread this know how and to other countries. So uh, I think we are definitely looking for your experiences on on this matter. Yeah. Uh, so did you think, uh, the Brenda? <laughs> yes, you gave well, me Let me just put it back on her again. <laughs> maybe, so, maybe, maybe. Yeah, Brenda? Sorry. So I'm a, I'm a bit of a sucker. So research has been most of my CV um, and um, teaching, tutoring. And I, I'm a sucker for conferences. Um, but like even just having like maybe a one or two day event where like you have people from all different levels from different continents and countries. And like, there could be a schedule where people can jump in. So like maybe North America can have a segment, Asia, and it could be like a one or two day things like where you just summarize the annual things, like what could you learn? And that way you could hear from everyone from different tiers from around the world. It's in like a span of one to two days and it could be like a normal conference. Um, maybe you can go in person, maybe you can do it virtually, but I think like just hearing from um, different people at different stages would be a good way and to organize it because like it's we're all busy and like if it's in a span of like one to two days or like a weekend it's easier you can plan your schedule like you would a conference but if it's like all interspersed it's a lot harder but yeah I think it would be really cool to hear from people of different levels like panels from everyone around the world in a one to two day conference. I think this medical student symposium is a kind of yes that's art. what I was thinking as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, definitely, Brenda, we, we definitely agree with you. And the first time actually IFM decided to do a medical student symposium as a start. But as you said, uh, the medical students is one part of it. And there is actually continuity about this in the residents and medical educators uh, in the emergency medicine. I think it should be all involved that, you know, uh, uh, structured uh, the activities that uh, we can get more benefits uh, from them, I believe. Um, yeah. I think- um, uh, I'll Please come to our, please, please, please come to our sympo medical student symposium. Please join us. Um, we're hoping to, you know, to get um, uh, students from seven regions, All right, Alpa? And yes. um, we'll be having yes. a break. We have, we have Africa, like, Asia, yeah. Europe, and uh, also South America with Central, Central and South America, North America. And we also have uh, Gulf and Oceania. The, we have seven groups, actually. Yeah. yeah. So you hear from everyone. Then you go into your groups and hear from people from your region. And you come out and hear from everyone again after that discussion in that group um, in yeah. your own region. And yeah. you get to hear from everyone yeah, again. So I would I encourage you to yeah. uh, attend. And of course, oh, sorry, we call that, I, you know, yeah. uh, the North Americans, 
you know, yeah. issues and, you know, solutions will be definitely different than, the, you know, Asia probably. So, but iPhone wants to combine all this information together and provide some kind of robust uh, applicable plan for yeah. the, the countries. I think Kayla was saying something in the Yeah, intro. that's right. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, I think we've discovered maybe during this is that it's helpful to have um, perspectives, not not only residents or only third year medical students, but kind of from all over in the same discussion, because it's helpful for me to hear from Hallie. It's helpful also for me to hear from Brenda and to think back um, on my experience as a third year and think, how could I have done differently? Or, you know, how are things changing um, for the third years now. And so I think as, as you guys move forward and host more discussions, it might be helpful to um, do something similar to this and just include uh, different areas of training. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a great idea. Definitely next academic year, probably we have to plan a couple of different formats, probably with the better uh, technical capacities yeah. I, think, <laughs> I know, yeah, I know I that there's there is still issue with the you know sound but don't worry after this session i will combine all the perfect recordings together and you know uh, upload them correctly in that place uh, i just want to actually the touch one uh, actually thing. alpha um yeah. brenda wanted to say something oh, yeah okay. sorry right. i was Go just ahead. gonna say kayla like just hearing you talk you kind of gave me a bit of an idea about like the whole idea of different perspectives um so in my school, one thing that we do is PBL or team-based learning. And last summer I was a uh, chair for um, a medical education conference where I got to listen to all these research projects and team-based learning is something that's growing. And I think it would really be cool in this conference to give like, to have a breakout session where everyone from different um, areas around the world got into a group and like we were given a patient or a case or a scenario, how would you deal with it? And just hearing how everyone around the world would deal with this patient or this case. Um, I know in different countries, certain things are prioritized, insurance systems, but just seeing or listening to how people would approach a patient or a scenario um, would be really, really cool. Um, thank you, Kayla, for being my muse on that one. Um, <laughs> just listening to you talk gave the idea. So thank you. You know what's going to happen, right, Brenda? By making that suggestion, we might actually get you to lead it. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get paid? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> to be you honest, the best part of conferences it. were the free meals. Like the fact you could just go, like they would we'll have really good food. We'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do. But we, I think that's a great idea, actually. I think that that is a great idea to see how, you know, um, I think we have to develop a mutual respect for our colleagues across the world, how they would handle you know, from uh, a situation with resource lim uh, limitations to, I guess, everything and everything there is, uh, you can throw at the patient. So, you know, I think it'll be interesting to yeah. actually hear from our colleagues across the world on this. Alpa, uh, what do you think? Actually, I was going to say the IFAM virtual events, which has started almost one, a year ago. Uh, I think... Uh, that event's also trying to do the similar what the Brenda and Kayla are actually recommending. Uh, of course, it's a, more like it is a kind of uh, expert level uh, and uh, countries or regions providing their approach to some problems, uh, let's say toxicology, I don't know, as, as a broad topic. Uh, but it is, it's, it's an expert level still. I mean, how we can involve the medical students, how we can involve the trainees and their educators to that different perspectives to taking care of something, whatever the you know, disease or problem is. Uh, I think it is a, it's, it's a new, new, new thing that we can try. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, she, she, she's actually recommending the same case. So giving the same case. Okay. Yeah. And so the difference seven uh, re people from seven different regions, countries, yeah. whatever it is, IFM regions, yeah. and actually asking them how they would handle it would make a great virtual event. Three of those cases, and 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 take them through it and see okay. how they would react, how how they react. You know, breakout rooms. Uh, I think is great idea. Thank you for giving us that sort of those sort of ideas. We might rope you in to help. Help us yeah, out with it. Definitely willing to help. Um, maybe Kayla and Hallie will get real. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm sure they would as well. I, I think Hallie, actually, you know, your 
um, global emergency medicine um, yeah. leadership uh, project, medic, uh, student leadership project. I think you run journal clubs in the same way as well. Is that is that right? Because I get a lot of emails from you. I ha- I'm going to be I'm going to be <laughs> frank. I have not actually attended one of those. I can't talk about it. But I have received you know a lot of correspondence around. Um, the uh, the journal clubs and is that the kind of thing that you talk about in the in the journal clubs that might be helpful to students different approaches to management absolutely we do some pretty similar things I'll put in a quick plug for the ASAP ambassador program which the gyms LP is kind of a brainchild of we have a conference that takes place during ASAP where we get to hear about the state of emergency medicine from different leaders across the world And it's interesting because usually we're hearing kind of from attending level people, not so much from trainees, though trainees do attend and hearing from you guys, it would be really nice to get more input from the medical students and trainees in these different countries as well. We always invite our GEMS LP mentees who are traditionally medical students to attend this conference, but they don't have a large role in the conference. And I think that would be awesome to kind of bring up for future meetings because I think across the board, we're all asking for more kind of integrative top down and everybody together sort of learning. So that's awesome. During Jim's LP, we do have sessions for our mentees where they will be given kind of like a little brainstorming project. We'll give them a problem and then they'll break out into different rooms and work on how to solve it. We've had um, some people who are working on learning how to write grants and different Every single journal club will have somebody who will present on a book chapter, somebody on a journal article, and then somebody who either comes up with some sort of problem and they would make a fake project proposal and present that to kind of like a board to see how they would um, distribute their funding or what their plans are, or they'll present on a clinical topic. I'm sorry, a clinical topic that's applicable in a global setting. So we we try to incorporate a lot of that for our students. And traditionally, it's only been students, but I think that starting with students would be good to help train them to enter this kind of new and adaptive learning environment that the world seems to be heading towards. And I'll put in one more final plug for our final journal club meeting tomorrow, and we'll hear about the projects that all of our mentees have been working on for the entire year. So it's a little bit different, um, and I'm excited about it. And if any of our listeners are interested in joining in the future, we open applications over the summer for the 2022-23 cycle. So Hope this to see you great. guys there. Would you put a link in the chat box? Would they see that link, Alpha? Uh, no, yeah, they can't, but I can share under the video. Can you share the link? Yeah. yeah, yeah because yeah. I think that's really important because I, I do get a lot of stuff from them. And, yeah. you know, it's good to hear this. But I think um, Brenda um, also has a great idea with, you know, almost like a team based um, challenge, if you want to call it that team based challenge based on local resources you know, how they would handle a situation. And I think that is something that would be exciting for our virtual events. So yes, we, we, we will get in contact with you, you again. And that would be a great IFEM collaboration with GEMS LP as well um, to actually come up with that kind of uh, team-based, um, team-based challenge. I would call it the team-based challenge. And it's not about who has the most resources. It's about what you do with those resources, given what you have, you know, given given the patient, what resources you have. So that would be if absolutely great. Thank, thank you for sharing that idea. I us. love that idea. <laughs> yeah, they're great. Actually, we are very happy as an IEM education project to collaborate with the GEMS LP. And uh, I just want to ask a couple of questions to Holly, actually. Holly, how many, how many students you're accepting for GEMS LP program in a year? So it's been growing every single year. Every year we have more mentors available. So that really broadens our availability to accept students because they want to make sure that we have a good ratio of people who are working with each student. I think this year we have about 20 and whenever it started, it was significantly less. So it is a, I don't want to say competitive process, but you definitely have to submit an application and we make sure that you're a right fit with our team and kind of have similar goals. And I will emphasize that it's directed at people who are interested specifically in emergency medicine in a global setting. So not just emergency yeah. medicine, but somebody who wants to pursue global health. So a little bit more specialized, but I think it's a great opportunity for learning and learning um, kind of some critical review skills and teamwork and everything like that. And it's a great networking opportunity. 
the, the program actually accepting the international uh, mentors or just you know specifically inside the the, the, the USA so uh, who are who are your mentors in, in general we have some international mentors for sure um, somebody who works with Russia we have somebody from Nepal and a lot of them are USA based but will have kind of very specific ties to these countries which is where they'll tie the medical students to work on their projects and they seem to really like that. We also accept students from all over the world, and that can be a little bit difficult because of time zones. Our meetings are consistently at 9 p.m. Eastern, but as long as they can make it work, we love having the input from our international students. They've been an excellent addition. Right. I, I think, you know, as IEM Education Project, we would like to do a special program for the GEMS LP team, maybe inviting, you know, a couple more uh, leaders and also the medical students. Uh, and then we can discuss more about uh, the GEMS LP to spread the word to the other awesome. countries too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, James, did we miss anything? Did we, no, I think, uh, I think it's been a very, very, uh, you know, I, I guess I learned a lot from, uh, from this chat. Right. Now, I learned a lot from, you know, just talking with you, uh, you know, the three of you around, you know, the challenges that you faced. Um, you, you were the cohort you know, that was slap bang in the middle of that pandemic. And um, my hat's off to you, actually. My hat's off to you because I think, you know, um, to, to weather that and to weather it well, as uh, as they say, no, no. Rather than hide from the rain, you play in the rain. So you know, I guess you've uh, weathered really well, and you've all been successful, all three of you. And I, my hats off to you. So yes, I did learn a lot from that, and thank you for you know for sharing. Yeah, uh, that's similar for me. Uh, before we close, and I need to go the other scene of course uh would you like to say anything uh, before we close maybe go through each one let's start off okay. with uh, kayla uh, i just want to say thank you for having me and um i also learned a lot and i'm looking forward to um helping out in the future on these fun team challenges and uh whatever else we we get into anything from your side brenda would you like to say anything for closure? Yeah, I wanted to say um, thank you for having me. Um, I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. And I guess like one thing that I even want to share like to people in the training um, process is never lose sight of humor and just having fun, even if you're in a rotation that you don't like. Um, a lot of people will tell you that things get depressing later. Just ignore them and have fun. I think laughter and humor is just like what gets me through medical school especially during the pandemic so don't lose sight of that right uh, uh, anything you want to say uh holly before we close just likewise thank you for having me this has been great and it's been really nice to hear from medical students and it's i've learned things that i can take away as a resident that will help me interact with them on shifts so this has been great thank you right and also the iam education project has many uh let's say the uh, sub project or mini projects. Uh, the most hot one is the updating our book, actually the, doing the second edition, let's say. Of course, we will invite you all, maybe we invited already uh, the behind the scenes, I don't know. Uh, we didn't check the actually responses yet uh, officially, but uh, the, if we didn't, we will definitely send you invitation to be part of that uh, contribution process as an auditor. Even the, even you can be the medical student still, it doesn't matter. So if you have a one attending physician to working with you in that uh, chapter or chapters, uh, it is totally fine. We just want the medical student be involved in everything what we are doing in the IEM education project. So we will contact with you soon. Uh, otherwise, James, would you like to add anything or do you want me to? I guess I'd like to finish off with really saying um, all three of you really embrace that whole concept of anyone, anytime, anything. So really, um, I'm not sure what I said in the right order, but I no. think <laughs> that really embraces the, the, whole, the whole idea of emergency medicine. I think it's supposed to be anyone, anything, anytime, isn't it? That's correct. So, 
It is correct. Well, it's that time of the night, isn't it? Yes, it you is. Know, even yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. All right. Everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much again to joining us and sharing your experiences. Uh, hopefully, we will see each other again in some other activities and enjoy emergency medicine. And yes. hope to see you soon. Bye bye. All right, everyone, we just uh, come to the closure of this activity. Before you close, uh, please uh, visit our website and be subscribe to uh, the, the resources so you can get some uh, activity emails or you know, newly published chapters or blog posts. So I thank all our guests again and hope to see you soon in other sessions, which is we are going to start in the next academic year.